a quorum being present, this annual town meeting of our 375th year is called to order. Please rise for the reflections to be given by Ms. Nancy Doctor. I'm not Nancy Doctor, but I'm. <laughs> Love is but a song to sing. Fear's the way we die. You can make the mountains ring or make the angels cry. Though the bird is on the wing and you may not know why. Some may come and some may go. We shall surely pass. When the one that left us here returns for us at last, we are but a moment's sunlight fading in the grass. If you hear the song I sing, you will understand. You hold the key to love and fear all in your trembling hand. Just one key unlocks them both. It's there at your end. Come on, people now. Smile on your neighbor. Everyone get together. Try to love one another right now. Thank you. And now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we also have a tradition. I would like to ask all of our newly elected town meeting members, or newly re-elected town meeting members, please rise for the oath of office. Please raise your hand and repeat after me. I solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent on me as a town meeting member according to the best of my ability and understanding agreeable to the Constitution and laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and, and to the Charter and Bylaws of the Town of Reading so help me God well, welcome, everybody. The clerk will now read the one. To any of the constables of the town of Reading, greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby required to notify and warn all the inhabitants of the town of Reading, qualified to vote in local elections at town affairs to meet at the following place designated by the eight precincts in said town. Ms. Alvarado moves that we dispense with the further reading except for the return. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed? No. By the virtue of this warrant, I, Thomas Freeman, on March 5th, 2019, notified and warned that the inhabitants of the town of Reading qualified to vote on town affairs to meet at the place and time specified by posting attested copies of the town meeting warrant in the following public places within the town of Reading. Precinct 1, Warren Killam School. Precinct 2, Reading Police Station. Precinct 3, Municipal Light Department. Precinct 4, Joshua Eaton School. Precinct 5, Reading Public Library. Precinct 6, Barrows Middle School. Precinct 7, Birch Meadow School. Precinct 8, Wood End School and Town Hall. The date of the posting being not less than 14 days prior to the April 2nd, 2019, the date set for the town meeting in this warrant. I also caused a posting of this warrant to be published on the Town Reading website on March 5th, 2019. Thank you. As is our tradition at the beginning of the annual town meeting every April, the chair reminds town meeting members and informs newly elected town meeting members about some of the basic rules and how we will proceed. Number one, when you are recognized, please wait until you have the microphone before speaking. In addition to being heard in the hall, we want you to be heard on RCTV as well. The tapes from the cable cast may be used in verifying the official report. Two, before speaking, please state your name and precinct. Three, members are limited to no more than 10 minutes. The chair will call on people roughly in the order that they raise their hands, taking those who have not yet spoken first. Non-members may speak but only after members have first had the opportunity to do so. Non-member proponents of a motion may speak with permission of the body. 
Remember to stay away from personal attacks and, or for the most part, personal references. We are here to discuss issues and not personalities. We no longer read the motions as all of you have a printed copy. The only time we read it is if there is a change from what you have. The moderator instead declares that the motion has been made. We then call on the main proponent to open discussion. Then we hear relevant reports. Financial articles are reported on by the Finance Committee, bylaw changes by the Bylaw Committee, and so forth. Then we open debate to all members. After debate has proceeded for a while, we may have someone move the previous question, or simply move the question. That is a call for debate to end. That motion itself is non-debatable, and we will proceed directly to the issue of stopping debate. That takes a two-thirds vote. The chair will not recognize that motion from a person who has just spoken. In other words, if you want to move the question, stop debate, that must be the only thing you have risen for. Amendments. We may have people offer amendments to motions on the floor. These will be accepted. Once an amendment is proposed and seconded, we debate only the merits of the proposed amendment, not the main motion. When, wet, when ready, we vote on the proposed amendment, then we return to debating the main motion, either as it stood before the proposed amendment or as amended, depending on how the vote to amend went. When proposing amendments, please provide them to the town clerk on an eight and a half by 11 sheet in order to get your wording correct. Town meeting members must be sitting in the lower portion of the hall if they want to be recognized as town meeting members and have their votes counted. Instructional motions. Article 3 is placed on the warrant by the, board of the Select Board and calls for instructional motions. These motions instruct various boards or individuals to do whatever the motion calls for. Technically, state law does not allow motions to be made when the subject matter does not first appear in the warrant. They have traditionally been allowed here because they are completely non-binding. Our bylaws stipulate that all main motions, which these are, must be made in writing. Additionally, I ask that they be written on an 8.5 by 11 sheet containing nothing but the motion. Otherwise, they are likely to be lost. In addition, I ask, whenever practical, all such motions be presented to the moderator at the beginning of each night's session. At some convenient point, the chair will inform the body what intended instructional motions have been presented. This is being done in fairness to those being instructed and deserve some semblance of notice, and to town meeting members who, when making a decision as to whether or not to adjourn for the evening, should know what business is still before them. Unlike all regular articles, members may have no idea what type of instructional motions will be made. There's often confusion with two particular motions, indefinite postponement and tabling. Let me give you a brief explanation, explanation of the difference. Indefinite postponement is a motion that asks the body not to vote for a particular motion during the life of this town meeting. Although it is thought of not so much as a vote against a particular issue, but rather a postponement, the result is the same. Voting in favor of indefinite postponement has the same result as voting against the main motion. If indefinite postponement carries, the main motion is defeated. A motion to indefinitely postpone is debatable. Tabling is used for another purpose altogether. Tabling temporarily puts a motion aside. It can be brought up again by anyone moving to take it from the table at any time before the meeting adjourns, sine die. This motion is non-debatable, although the chair will allow a brief explanation as to why the motion to table has been made. Adjournment. There are two types of adjournment. At the end of an evening, we adjourn to a time certain. Tonight, for instance, when we are done for the evening, presumably we will adjourn until Thursday. When we are done with the business of town meeting, we adjourn sine die, which translates to without day. In other words, the meeting is complete. And finally, please use non-audible alarms on your phones and other gadgets. All right, uh, we have a couple more announcements before we move on. First, as most of you or all of you probably know, we lost one of our major town contributors this year. And I have Russ Graham, another one of our major town contributors, to say a few words. Russ? moderator. It has been said sometimes that a town can be defined by those who they have chosen to lead them. If that be the case, certainly the town of Reading will be defined as a kinder, better, more productive community because Camille Anthony passed this way. 
If you love trees, think of Camille Anthony. If you like lower speed limits, you should have called Camille Anthony. If you wanted to know about any part or portion of the town of Reading, Scorn, you could have called Camille Anthony. She and I first worked together when she and I first worked together when she was a member of the Conservation Committee, and I was actually young and a member of the Finance Committee. And we pondered over what to do with that nasty little piece of land down on then John Street, which was called the dump. She had many ideas, and many of them through the years came to fruition. It took me many years to realize that when Camille called me and said, Russ, this is really terrible. We've got to do something about this. What should we do? I really took a long time to realize it wasn't a question. She proceeded to tell me what it is we were going to do. Camille was a force of nature. I cannot think of a single part of the town of Reading that she was not involved with. And if you were at the Congregational Church on the day of her service, every seat, including every seat in the choir, was filled with those who knew her and who loved her. Her daughter at that service said that sometimes she would embarrass them because when you met Camille, it was not long before she knew your name, where you were born, where you came from, what you did, and eventually she'd get to what you might be able to do for the town of Brennan. You had to know her to know she was not being nosy. She was genuine and sincerely interested in you as a person, and she wanted to truly know you. We are a better community, a better town, and of all the contributions that she made, as great as they were, all of us will miss that incredible smile. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Next, Mr. Brown has asked to speak for a couple of minutes on a couple of anniversaries coming up, which are not the 375th. Mr. Brown. Can you hear me? Thank you. I'm sure that most of you are aware that uh, Reading is celebrating its 375th birthday. For 300 of those years, there has been an open meeting on March 6, 1944, that changed when 204 newly elected members, uh, together with 15 additional members by virtue of office, met to convene their first representative town meeting. When we convened tonight, we marked the historic event. We became the 75th representative town meeting in Reading's history. And I'm proud to say I've been here two thirds of it. Maybe some of you don't agree with that, but that's all right. Another little uh, tidbit. When Reading Memorial High School football team takes the field this year, they will be the 75th rocket team to do so. No, they were not named after the Nike site. No, they were not named after the water tower. The then Reading, Memorial, Reading High School yearbook, Pioneer States, and I quote, Yay, man, that rocket RHS ignited on September 23rd left a red-hot trail of sparks through the victory stratosphere and will be a cute trick to keep them glowing next year. But everything's ready and waiting, so good luck, rockets of 1944, 45, I'm sorry. And I know you're gonna ask the question. They were Crimson Raiders before that. And one time they actually played on what is now Washington Park and they played on the lights in all due respect to my friend Kyle McCutton before he put him in here. Thank you.
All right, now we begin with Article 2, which is report. First up is a report on the 375th, oh, excuse me. Uh, okay, uh, the first report is on the 375th anniversary, and we call on Ms. Borowski. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, fellow town meeting members. I'm Jean Borowski, Precinct 6, and I'm delighted to be speaking on behalf of the Reading 375 Steering Committee. As I'm sure you're all aware, uh, this spring, Reading will be celebrating our 375th anniversary. From May 31st through June 15th, we will be celebrating with two straight weeks of food, music, art, fun community events, and stories and history that are unique to our town. There is literally something for everyone during this two-week celebration. I hope as you want into town meeting tonight, you noticed our big purple tent where you can pick up a flyer to learn more about what we have planned for this two-week celebration. And good news, if you did not get a chance to do so, um, we'll have the big purple tent up on Thursday night as well. So on Thursday, you can pop by and get a flyer to get a list of all the events for the two-week celebration. You can also go to our website, writing375.com, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So there's a whole bunch of different ways you can keep up to date. I am here to ask for your help, however, in spreading the word about the upcoming Reading 375 anniversary celebration to your friends and to your neighbors. We're hoping that you'll help us get the word out um, through email, through social media, and through good old-fashioned face-to-face conversations. The only other thing we'd like to ask is that you join us beginning on May 31st. This is a unique opportunity to come together as a community and celebrate Reading's history and all that makes our town special today. On behalf of the steering committee, we do hope to see you all there. Thank you. Next, we have an update on an instructional motion, uh, RMLD payment. Ms. Alvarado. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Vanessa Alvarado, Chair of the Select Board. Uh, before I give my report, I would like to thank former Select Board member Dan Ensminger for his contributions to this report and his work on the subcommittee these past two years. Uh, at the 2017 Annual Town Meeting, an instructional motion was passed instructional motion was passed requesting that the select board in light of the town's difficult financial situation study the Red Reading Municipal Light Department with an objective of increasing annual revenues to the town of Reading. The select board and the RMLD Board of Commissioners agreed to convene a joint subcommittee to study this issue. The report this evening is to provide an update to town meeting on the current status of this matter. By way of background, RMLD provides two annual payments to the town of Reading. One is referred to as above the line. That means it is built into RMLD's annual operational budget. Reading's above the line payment from RMLD based on kilowatt hour usage is currently approximately 300,000 per year. It is based on a formula established in 1998. The other towns serviced by RMLD, North Reading, Linfield, and Wilmington also receive a payment based on kilowatt hour usage. The second payment, is referred to as below the line and is separate and in addition to RMLD's annual operational budget. Since 1998, it has been tied to the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, and is currently about 2.48 million per year. The other towns do not receive this payment. The instructional motion from 2017 was made in regards to this below the line payment. In 2018, RMLD staff conducted a study that explored the impact of a forecasted decline in kilowatt hour sales on the ability of RMLD to fund future below the line payments to Reading. The select board has worked with RMLD commissioners to find a temporary agreement to the below the line payment from RMLD to the town of Reading, while a permanent funding formula is developed to address the concerns of both parties. The agreement reached is as follows. For the next two years, 2019-2020, the RMLD board has agreed to freeze the below the line payment to Reading to match the 2018 rate, which is 2.48 million. The intention is to use those two years to create the new formula for determining the payment going forward. The select board, RMLD commissioners, the finance committee, and town and RMLD staff will be working together on this formula to find a mutually beneficial arrangement. 
Should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to the Select Board or the RMLD Commissioners. We would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Next, the Elementary School Space Study Update. Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Doherty. Have your presentation. Just do it. Okay. Good evening, town meeting members. Uh, we felt it would be important to give an update on the elementary planning and enrollment study. At this point, this is the first of a few capital items that you'll hear about throughout the town meeting sessions. The planning and enrollment study was a required part of the process that the Permanent Building Committee asked to do, um, and as well as if in the future we would be looking at possible Massachusetts School Building Authority uh, submission, we would need to be doing an elementary planning study as well. So um, this is the first step for either of those uh, areas. Currently, there is a screening committee that's been working on um, with the consultant to provide information regarding the study. That, that steering committee consists of Director of Facilities Joe Huggins and Chief Financial Officer Gail Dowd. We've given a few updates so far, two in November of 2018, one to the school committee meeting uh, and one to town meeting. Uh, February 7th, we also gave an update at the school committee meeting. March 28th, we also gave an update at the school committee meeting and now here at April town meeting. And uh, when we get the next available information, our hope is to um, give an update at the school committee meeting in either May or June. Just to recap a little bit, in November of 2018, town meeting approved uh, $227,000 uh, for the purpose of an elementary school space needs and demographic slash enrollment study. Uh, in mid-January of 2019, uh, GNAP Design Architecture was se selected as what was called the house doctor, with the role of being the main firm executing all phases of the project, which will also include the enrollment piece. In March of 2019, we engaged NESDEC, uh, through the NAP contract to prepare the enrollment study phase of the, of the project. And then the expectation is that NESDEC will be conducting that full demographic study, which is currently happening, which will include a 10-year enrollment projection. And just so the town meeting is aware, we've not had a full 10-year enrollment projection done um, since around 2000. And uh, currently what is going on is NESDEC has been provided with the historical enrollment information uh, from both the school department and also has been in contact with Assistant Town Manager Jean Delios to discuss the various economic development and building activities that are occurring throughout the town. NESDEC will also be contacting, and I believe they've already have been contacting, local realtors to discuss recent trends in housing sales, and then GNAP will be touring all of the five elementary schools to gather information that will be used as part of the study. And then these tours will be ongoing to gather as much detailed information as possible. And then the next phase of it in May and June, GNAP's going to provide initial findings and recommendations, which will pre be presented at a school committee meeting. And then those will be reviewed and analyzed during the summer and in the fall of, of, of this year. And school and town officials will review those. And our hope is to have either an update or further action for November town meeting. So that's our report at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the state of the town. We will have it by uh, two, bo both the outgoing and incoming chairs. So we'll begin with uh, Mr. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, everyone. Tonight's State of the Town Address, as the moderator just mentioned, will be delivered in two parts, the first by the outgoing chair, myself, and the second by the incoming chair, Vanessa Alvarado. There's so much we could talk about when it comes to the state of our town. Our government's condition and financial health, for example, often take the spotlight. And while it is important to reflect on how our schools and town are running, those discussions will come later. Tonight, I would like to focus on an overlooked, often overlooked force 
that plays an integral role in the determining the state of the town of Reading. This force is the spirit of volunteerism. Volunteers, people who care deeply about this town. Without them, Reading as we know it would not exist. Imagine what things would be like if all of you, the elected members of town meeting, didn't care enough to show up tonight. Likewise, consider the scores of volunteers that make up elected and appointed boards, committees, and commissions. Without all of these government workers who give countless hours to help run this town, life in Reading would be prohibitively expensive and decidedly less democratic. If government volunteers are the cogs that keep the town running, there are others who make Reading really shine. Consider the groups that do such important work with our schools, like Samantha's Harvest, Understanding Disabilities, the Reading Education Foundation, and the various parent-teacher organizations. Then there are individuals who give their time for music, art, the sciences, and athletics. Still other groups, the Quantipowit Players, Colonial Chorus, the Reading Symphony Orchestra, and the Reading Singers, to name a few, add so much to Reading's culture. There are the youth, organiza there are the youth sports organizations, also fueled by volunteers that provide athletic opportunities to the town youth and financial support to our high school teams. Just last week, the select board accepted a gift from the Reading Little League Baseball to, make, uh, to revamp the majors field and to install much needed portable toilets at a number of uh, these, a number of ball fields. When unexpected needs in town come up, there are always seems to be people, there always seems to be people there to help. The Rotary Cup, the Rotary Club stepped up recently to organize the Reading Fall Street Fair. They are already looking for volunteers to help make the next one another success. To counter the hate-filled graffiti in town, a number of proactive individuals came together to form Reading Embraces Diversity, a group that promotes inclusivity. Last October, they organized an uh, anti-hate rally on the town green. Soon, as mentioned, it will be time to re celebrate Reading's 375th anniversary. Naturally, there's a group of volunteers who have committed their time and energy to make the anniversary something very special. The, steer the Reading 375 Steering Committee have amazing events planned, including Porch Fest, Vintage Basketball, Clubhouse at the Tavern, Revelry at the Tavern, all on June 8th, and the grand finale on June 15th, including hot air balloon rides, live music, food trucks, fireworks, and a dog parade. Uh, I hear they try, did try to include the cats, but um, they just give that, this is so beneath me look. <laughs> our, our town's strong spirit of volunteerism is a clear demonstration of just how many people care, care deeply about Reading. These volunteers are the glue that make us not just a town, but a community. I tip my hat to our volunteers to keeping Reading healthy, strong, and vibrant this past year. The select board members are also a vital group of, volunteer, of members of this volunteer community. Th through, though the past year brought chal its challenges, we, we took care of town business. We were also successful at setting goals for the board, 
some of which have already been completed, others are still in progress. And I'm confident that we will wrap them up and add new ones. This marks the time for, to look ahead. For that, I yield the podium to our newly elected chair, Vanessa Alvarado. Alvarado. Ms. Alvarado. Clearly, Andy's a lot taller. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Andy, for providing our community with a look back of 2018. Uh, and thank you to, mo to Moderator Folds for granting me the opportunity to talk to you tonight. As we move into 2019-2020 fiscal year, I'd like to recognize those who are new or returning to elected offices. Chuck Robinson is returning to serve on the school committee, and he is joined by newcomers John Parks and Tom Wise. As the parent of two children in our school system, I give heartfelt gratitude for the many hours you devote to our children. The RMLD Board of Commissioners welcomes back Phil Pacino and Dave Talbot. Thank you for keeping the lights on. The Board of Library Trustees welcomes back John Brzezinski and Dubois. The library is a true gem in our town. Thank you for making it possible. Of course, everyone's favorite moderator, Alan Fools, is back again for the 23rd year. The select board welcomes two new members, Ann Landry and Mark Doxer, both joining us after serving several years on the Finance Committee. Lastly, welcome to all the new and returning town meeting members. You are a vital part of town government, and I thank you for your initiative, your thoughtfulness, and your active participation in our local democracy. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Dan Ensminger and Barry Berman. Dan has served in numerous capacities as a town volunteer for almost four decades, most recently as a select board member. From his start in 1980, Dan recognized the importance of, thinking, of forward thinking on the part of volunteers who run town government and has played an instrumental role in many major advancements in Reading. Dan, thank you for your years of past, present, and future dedication to our town. Barry has been an engaged member of our community for over two decades, serving as a Little League coach, a Finance Committee member, and as a selectman. He was one of the driving forces for economic development in town and a strong advocate for the housing development plan. He's with us this evening as a town meeting member and I thank him for his many contributions. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the loss of one of my mentors, Camille Anthony. She exemplified what it means to be a public servant. Her wisdom, her passion, her grace are all things she was well known for. Well, that and the look she could give you that spoke volumes. I knew I had gone off track and would raise that one eyebrow at me. Camille made us strive for a better Reading. She will be missed. Recently, someone asked me what my vision for the town is this coming year. When I reflected on that, it wasn't budgets or buildings I saw. It was our community. For the coming year, I see my neighbors, my fellow elected officials and volunteers, town staff and residents alike working together in a productive and unified effort to maximize the opportunities ahead of us. And it's both a challenging and exciting year we're looking towards. The work of this town could not be accomplished without the efforts of our many wonderful volunteers working closely with our town staff. Over the last few years, you have all laid the groundwork for some big projects in Reading. We've established an ad hoc committee to create a human rights commission. This is in response to the anti-Semitic, homophobic, and racist graffiti found in town. Reading is not unique in this struggle. It is something communities across the country are dealing with. While no one likes to make the front page of the globe for this kind of behavior, I am proud of our community for dealing with it head on. Economic development is an ongoing priority. We're continuing the in-depth discussion around development for our downtown and expanding it to include the potential along Walkersbrook Drive. Thanks to a grant by the state, we will be working with consultants to find opportunities to improve these areas, while at the same time recognizing what existing residents love about our bedroom community. The development known as Postmark Square is underway. 
We're looking forward to seeing the results of what collaborative economic development looks like with the completion of this project. It's worth noting that the developer is a local resident, and I thank him for setting the bar for what a good neighbor looks like. We've had preliminary discussions with RMLD on how we can work together to make Reading greener and to partner for mutually beneficial financial, financial outcomes. The future is electric. We'll also be working with RMLD on revising the formula to determine the payment from RMLD to the town of Reading, as you've already heard. While the town manager and superintendent will go into more detail, I would like to mention the successful implementation of the override funding. Our town is stronger, safer, and providing necessary services thanks to your vote. In the past two years, we've heard from various organizations about the efforts being undertaken to make our town more senior and dementia friendly. This is an area all of us on the board are eager to support. In just a few weeks, we'll be celebrating the 375th anniversary of the town. This is a shining example of the dedication and commitment of our residents. The lead up to the celebration began five years ago um, with hundreds of, um, um, and has involved 50 residents in, involved in advanced planning with hundreds more volunteering during the celebration itself. It has involved 60 local sponsors and countless staff. For all of you who made the upcoming celebration possible, thank you. And while we're talking about celebrations, let's wish Mr. Nelson Bank a happy 98th birthday. His gen His generosity to youth activities via the Burbank Serena has resulted in decades of athletic engagement by our youth and has benefited the town via three million in contributions over the past 25 years. Thank you and happy birthday, Mr. Burbank. As we look to the year ahead, let us appreciate how fortunate we are to live in a community that cares. A community that comes together in times of need. A community that is so filled with selfless volunteers. A community of neighbors who will work together to move our town forward. Thank you for being a part of things future. I look forward to working with you in this town meeting session and throughout 2018 and 19, or huh, 19 and 20. <laughs> Thank you. Next, the financial update by Mr. Burkhart. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Apparently, Vanessa's a lot shorter. <laughs> uh, Mr. Moderator, request more than 10 minutes for my comments. Is there any objection? And appearing, Mr. Burkhart. Thank you. Put your mind at ease, everybody. I ran through this earlier today and it clocked in at 9 minutes and 58 seconds. <laughs> You should take it as a sign of, uh, a good sign, hopefully, that you have a finance committee member who is conservative. So. <laughs> good evening, town meeting members, boards and committees, and fellow Reading residents. My name is Eric Burkhart, and I chair your finance committee. I've been a town meeting member for four years and on your finance committee for three. Your finance committee is a group of nine of your fellow residents, and I'd like to introduce them to you. On your far left is Sean Brandt. Next to Sean is Karen Herrick. And then Dan Dewar and Paula Perry. Mark Mall, Paul McNeese are also on the Finance Committee. They could not be here tonight. You'll notice that I only noted seven of us. That's because Ann Landry and Mark Doxer, for some odd reason, <laughs> decided to leave the Finance Committee on some chaotic mission to charge some windmill. All kidding aside, I'd like to congratulate each of them on their election to the Select Board and thank them for their service on the Finance Committee. Ann was on FinCom for five years and brought a valuable perspective by combining her law background with her financial insight and creative thinking. Mark has been a steady, rock-solid voice on FinCom for almost nine years. He would have aged out of the group after this year, <laughs> so I'm glad he found something else to do. <laughs> Thank you to each of you, and I'm glad to be able to continue to work with you in your new capacity. So, a quick plug before I continue with my comments. We have two openings on your finance committee. If you are interested or know of anyone, please submit the application to Town Hall. 
A selection committee will review all applications and conduct interviews. I was talking to somebody about this the other day and he asked me what traits I thought were valuable for somebody on the finance committee. To me, the most important trait is fearless inquisitiveness. We want to understand the details. We're not afraid to ask the questions. I know this describes many of you. If you have any questions about FinCom, I or any of my fellow <coughs> remaining committee members will be glad to talk with you. All right, on with my comments. The role of your finance committee is to examine all the finance related matters of the town and to advise you town meeting. This work includes a thorough review of the annual budget, both town and schools. We familiarize ourselves with budget detail and nuance, attend select board and school committee meetings where they hear budget proposals, and hold our own series of meetings to review the budget and then to vote. We meet regularly throughout the year in open meetings, and we also sponsor a series of financial forums where the elected boards, as well as any interested citizens, join us for an open discussion about the financial challenges and opportunities facing the town. These forums are meant to encourage a dialogue on how best to work together to most effectively spend our money. The annual budget process begins in the early fall for the fiscal year starting the following July. It began in earnest with our financial forum last October, where we reviewed prior year results, examined the revenue outlook for the upcoming year, and considered forecasts for new growth. On the cost side, we looked at the environments for costs that are largely outside of our control, such as health care. And with all this in mind, we recommended budget targets for the upcoming year, including how much free cash to support the budget. A brief note on free cash, which many of you have heard before, but bears repeating. Free cash is a misnomer, it's not free. The best way to think of this is as a rainy day fund. How apropos, right? Uh, it's a reserve account to be used for one-time expenses and unexpected needs. In general, it's best not to use free cash for operating expenses, as those expenses are then built into the budget and recur every year. However, free cash can grow through a process called regeneration. One way free cash is regenerated is when budgeted expenses are not spent. For example, if a position is budgeted for but not filled. The Finance Committee has a policy that sets our cash reserves minimum target at 7% of revenues. This is to ensure that we are in a good position to handle unexpected one-time needs and it helps the town achieve its AAA bond rating as well. Because our free cash position has remained strong and we've seen regeneration, your finance committee has recommended a certain amount be used to support the operating budget in re years. At that financial forum in October, after examining our free cash, po cash position and considering the outlook on revenues and costs, we recommended that $1 million be used to support the fiscal year 20 budget, which is generally in line with recent years. All of this consideration in October led us to give guidance of 3.25% growth for the operating budgets for fiscal year 20. With this guidance, the town and schools began working to develop their budgets. Over several meetings, the town department heads presented their budget needs and requests to the select board and the superintendent and school leadership presented theirs to the school committee. Your finance committee attended these meetings and participated in the conversation. The school committee voted their budget in late January and sent their budget to the town manager. The town manager then combined the town and school budgets and presented a balanced budget to FinCom. Over several meetings in February and March, we reviewed the balanced budget and then voted unanimously on March 13th to recommend it to you, town meeting. While I wouldn't say it was easier to review the fiscal year 20 than those in recent years, it was certainly less stressful. The passing of the override last April relieved the cost pressures of recent years, and for the first time in a while, we reviewed a budget that did not contain cuts to level services. And in fact, it restored some of the services cut in prior years. And I want to join others in thanking residents of Reading for their vote in favor of the override. One question I heard often in the weeks leading up to that vote was whether town and school leadership would in fact use the override funds to address the specific needs they described. 
And those who ask this legitimate question should be glad to see that the funds have been spent exactly as promised. On the town side, almost all the positions funded by the override have been filled, including five police officers, four firefighters, and the library is open on Sundays. Page 32 of the warrant details the status of all the override funded expenses for the town. On the school side, the teaching administration and administrative positions funded by the override have been filled or retained, and the curricu and curriculum has been updated. See pages 103 and 104 of their warrant for the detail there. While some of the budget pressure has been alleviated by the override, they're not gone for good, and we must remain diligent moving forward. On the revenue side, total property tax revenues, excluding new growth, can still only increase 2.5% a year, and state aid continues to be significantly below historical levels. On the cost side, some costs continue to grow more than 2.5% annually. Unfunded mandates continue, and some costs remain uncontrollable and unpredictable, including health care and SNICE. In addition, we've seen increased volatility in the area of special education, and we must think about the best way to handle that volatility from a budgetary perspective moving forward. In addition to the operating budget, there are other key financial decisions that will face the town in the near future. As many of you are aware, there are three potential large-scale projects at various stages of evaluation. You just heard from Dr. Doherty about the spa school space needs study underway, and a resulting project here uh, could include renovations to Killam. There's the senior center, and there's the potential construction of a new DPW facility. These projects could not be funded from the operating budget and would be debt exclusions, voted on by the citizens of the town. Rest assured that your finance committee will embrace its role in closely examining the financial details of any proposal, but we also look forward to engaging in creative thinking and joining the larger discussion about how best to achieve the community's goals from a financial perspective. All of this said, I believe Reading has a promising future, both broadly speaking and financially. The override passed, we are financially stable. And there are economic project, development projects underway and potentially much more to come. For fiscal year 20, your finance committee recommends to town meeting a budget that consists of estimated revenues of $102 million with a recommended $1 million from free cash, bringing total available funds to $103 million or up 2.87% from last year. Accommodated costs are budgeted at $38 million, leaving $65 million for operating expenses, or the plus 3.25% versus last year. We believe this budget was responsibly, thoroughly, and thoughtfully built, properly manages risk, and supports the overall objectives as defined by the town and schools. Thank you. Article 3, Ms. Alvarado moves that we lay the substance of Article 3 on the table. Is there a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Business under Article 4, Mr. Lalasher. Back for the short guy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, for those new to town meeting, um, the next two articles are somewhat related. Article 4 describes the capital plan and it moves things around. Um, Article 5 would actually fund the capital plan uh, in a typical year. So again, in Article 4, um, we're just assigning items and priorities to them. Um, what you see in front of you is actually fairly slim pickings for the current year FY19's budget. We don't need any funds for FY19 in the general fund, but we do need to add in a bridge or bridges. Um, GPW was outstanding and received a $500,000 very competitive grant to rebuild some of the bridges uh, down behind REI, and you'd only know about them if they collapsed. This will help them not collapse. Um, so they need to be in the capital plan, even though there's no money needed in order for work to be done on them. 
and then uh, uh, in, a, in a different direction in a sewer station at, at Charles Street, um, we uncovered some very unexpected arsenic many, many feet down. And this is a testament to why you need reserves. Uh, the sewer reserve fund was very, very healthy. And this uh, request to put an additional 475000 for remediation is easily handled by reserves. Um, some communities would have to raise rates mid-year to handle such a thing like this, but, you know, FinCom has some good policies, and, and this is a reason why you follow them. So again, just two simple changes in FY19. One of them will come from uh, sewer reserves. I won't go over all the items, but Bond Council likes to also be very explicit and show you next year's capital changes. For those that have been on town meeting previously, you see a great deal of our work in capital happens, tends to happen in November town meeting. Um, so again, this is by comparison small changes. And the changes that you see in FY20 really were all driven by town meeting's decision and FinCom's request last fall to speed up work on Turf 2. So in order to fit Turf 2 into an FY20 um, perspective, and we had planned on it a year later, we had to reduce uh, some of the capital spending. And you can see that in the top section with some things uh, moved out into FY21 in future years. Likewise, there's a, a couple of changes in the FY20 enterprise funds. Uh, Gazebo Circle was actually called to our attention uh, because of a uh, 40B project in Wakefield. And as we got talking to some of the neighbors uh, and residents and realized their water pressure situation was not going to be solved by Wakefield because there had been some talk of Wakefield, uh, the Wakefield project needing water from Reading, um, you know, we'll have to take care of it ourselves. So this will design a new system, and then we have planned in FY21 a funding of that uh, should it happen the way it's described. Uh, and last but not least, um, again, Bond Council likes to look out a year. There's a couple of small changes that were moved, if you will, from FY20 to 21, um, most particularly those two items, uh, facilities and TPW. The entire capital plan is at the back of your book. Um, and again, this article just simply recognizes the capital plan. It does not spend any money. Income report, Mr. Dewar. At our March 13th meeting, FinCom voted 7-0 to recommend this article to town meeting. Is there further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? Oh, is there, oh I'm sorry, Ms. Binda. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I have a question. I don't know if it would come up here or somewhere else. Um, I'm going to make a motion under Article 15 to reduce the amount of money under Article 15 from $2.25 million to $1.75 million, and I would like $500,000 to come from capital um, debt authorization under Birch Meadow Lighting, which would reduce that amount. Is that something that needs to come here? And I have an explanation for it once Article 15 comes out, but it is something that needs to be done here also? No. So it's not re relevant to this article. It's not relevant to this article. So Correct. That, so debt authorization could moved and has nothing to do with this. We'll certainly discuss that as part of Article 15, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr. Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jonathan Barnes, Precinct 5. Um, Bob, I'm just curious about the, uh, the enterprise funds, this tour, uh, that $475,000. I know that you said that it's in relation to unexpected arsenic discovered deep underground. Do we know the cause uh, or the uh, location or the, is that a naturally occurring situation or an accident? Um, really, we don't know. Um, what we do know is that, that it didn't leach into the water system because then it would have run into the millions of dollars to fix, thankfully. Um, there was guesses as to what was there, and the most leading guess that people seem to think was true was rat poison many, many, many years ago. Because this was significantly below ground, and at the time sewer stations were built, it's possible 
that Radisson was added, but no one knows for sure. And we have had no evidence prior to getting as deep as this project got, and we have no expectation that we'll run into this in other sewer stations, so it, it could well have been naturally occurring. And it was, it was right over the borderline of the, the amount you had to do something about. I actually asked EPW just to take all the dirt away, just to be safe. Thank you. Uh, yes, in the... <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Richard Coco, Precinct 4. I've had a chance to speak to members of the Council on Aging. I understand one of the two vans is out of commission permanently. And I'm asking the question why in fiscal 20 uh, is not a, uh, something on the capital outlay plan to purchase a new, a second van to replace the one that's out of commission. Mr. Lasher. Um, if you look at page 178, it is there. It was approved last November town meeting, so it's not listed as a change tonight. But if you look under Elder Human Services van in the middle of page 178 under FY20, there is $60,000 planned. So that's in, that's in the budget for Correct. fiscal tw Okay, thank you very much. You bet. And yes, right here. Hi, thank you. Caitlin Mercurio, Precinct 2. Uh, in regards to the arsenic, I know you said it didn't get into the water system, but do we have residents in the neighborhood on well water? Does anyone know from DPW? Yeah, we don't believe there's wells, certainly not in the immediate area. Okay. The, the neighborhood was well advised. <laughs> oh, that was my next question. Yeah. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Brown. Uh, a little background to Mr. Byron's Bar question. Uh, years ago, there used to be a greenhouse just north of that intersection, as there were many greenhouses around Reading that use arsenic for uh, raising their plants, so it could have well came from there many years ago. We looked for the old lace bill, but we couldn't find that. Further discussion? None appearing? Am I missing anybody? None appearing? Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. <coughs> this is under Article 5, Mr. Lalasha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, it, although it doesn't come out quite as dramatically in your handouts, you'll see here there's some things in red and there's been one change. Um, the change was um, there is a balance needed for snow and ice and we're able to fund that by taking it out of the health insurance premiums. I just want to spend a minute in making sure a town meeting knows that the 15 unions, town, school, and light department have worked really hard on health insurance with management, with myself and with others, John and, and Colleen. Um, last year we had a minus 0.6% premium increase or change. For FY20, it's minus 3.5%. Those of you in the private sector, I doubt there's very many that have back-to-back -back negative years and that the unions have worked very hard on this and they're committed to work one more year very hard starting in September. Um, I have to tip my hat to them because there was a lot of political pressure outside of the town especially to join the GIC. Um, I won't tell you the community I was in yesterday reading their uh, budget book while visiting my parents. One would understand why I would, perhaps. Um, and the equivalent number in Reading would have been a $2 million increase in health insurance, and they are in the GIC. The unions worked very hard not listening to the politicians, if you will, in the State House advertising this product, and we saw it for what it was. It was confusing, it was superficial, and it was uh, economically troubled. Not to say it wasn't a good idea, but it, it had some problems. Um, perhaps someday the GIC will be attractive to the town of Reading. Uh, that day is in the future still. So I, I just want to make sure that the town understands that we're, we're moving 457000 out of health insurance that we did not need this year. And you, you move some in November town meeting also. And we have some that we're going to ask to be put in OPEB because of the union's hard work. 
And um, you'll see as part of the FY20 budget presentation, it was a simple matter once we knew where the negotiations were going to move 300,000 into the out of district special ed on behalf of the schools. So our, our outlook financially, um, partly because of really solid health insurance news and certainly because of the override is very good. There's still a few issues to be tackled, state aid being one of them. Um, you see the changes being suggested. There's really not a lot for a, a year end. Uh, in addition to the health insurance excess, we have some small items. We need to replace the equipment trailer for, the, for elections. We had a vacant position in economic development that I'll come back to, and a couple of other small lines, both up and down. Uh, the net of which is we do not need any free cash to balance this year's budget, which is really very good news. Um, we are asking town meeting to reduce a $70,000 planned expense from the permits revolving fund uh, to the economic development position, which did remain vacant. We are down to three finalists, though. And lastly, in uh, the sewer fund, we are asking to use 475000 from the reserves to pay for the capital item I just described. Income report, Ms. Perry. Finance Committee met on March 13th, 2019, and with the exception of the red outlined numbers that Bob just reviewed, we voted 7-0 in support of the article. And again, as Bob emphasized, to be here this year, not to be dipping more into free cash is a great thing. So again, we're, we're also thrilled about the health care you know, budget. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Uh, article 6, I understand we have no prior year's bills. So Ms. Alvarado moves that we lay the substance of Article 6 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the substance of Article 6 is laid on the table. Article 7, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this is to approve the disposition of surplus property. There are 20 assets in total. You'll see 10 on each slide. The estimated values of these assets range from zero to $16,000. This is 10 here. And that's the remaining 10. Authorization of this article will allow the town to sell, exchange, or dispose of these assets. report, Ms. Herrick. Good evening. On March 19th, the Finance Committee voted 7-0 to um, approve this motion. Is there further discussion? And appear. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 8, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, this article simply replaces a, an existing general bylaw with a Board of Selectmen or Select Board policy. Um, when this was put together, the policy had not yet been approved, so it was con voted contingent by both the bylaw committee and by the Finance Committee. In March, um, the Select Board did vote and approve a policy that both bodies had seen verbatim. Um, the long and short of this policy is, as you can see, um, our, procure, our shared procurement officer did a survey of our peer communities and typically 90% of the time it was done by select board policy. Um, and it just raises the bar from the article you just saw so that we'll only bring to you things that are either $10,000 or we think might be close enough to $10,000 to ask your permission. For things that are clearly below $10,000, and you can see it was the majority of that list, um, the select board will just be able to dispense with them right away. Um, this is becoming increasingly important, not so much because it's a nuisance to do it at this time of year, um, but because of online uh, bidding, we're able to uh, dispose of things much quicker than we were in the past and get very competitive bids. And so to have the permission available to us at an instant is very helpful. My law committee report, Mr. Strubel. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Struble, Chair of the Bylaw Committee. 
as the town manager explained, uh, on January 30th, we met and reviewed this article and uh, voted 4-0 to recommend it with the condition that the select board uh, uh, adopt uh, the policy, that which at that time we only saw as a draft. Uh, as he explained, on I think it was March 26th, they adopted it formally. We had another meeting on April 9th and voted 5-0 to recommend the content of this article unconditionally. Incom report, Ms. Herrick. Thank you. When the FinCom met on March 13th, um, we also recommended this article to town meeting, um, also uh, conditional uh, that the select board adopted a policy for the disposal of surplus property prior to town meeting. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 9, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to move the OPEB contributions that were approved as part of the Fiscal 19 budget into the OPEB Irrevocable Trust. We always do this at April Town Meeting to um, make sure that we, th that OPEB isn't needed for health insurance shortage. Um, and you did see in the prior um, vote on Article 5 that we did move 275,000 more than we originally budgeted because we had excess in health insurance. And if in court. At our meeting on March 13th, the Finance Committee voted 7-0 to recommend this article to Town Meeting. Is there further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 10, Ms. Angstrom. Oops. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to create a new enterprise fund for PEG cable access. As of July 1, 2019, the Department of Revenue is requiring all cities and towns to have a separate fund that is appropriated each year for PEG access. The funding source for this enterprise fund are PEG fees that come in from Verizon and Comcast, um, and those fees come in earmarked for PEG services. Over the last 20 years, we've outsourced to RCTV, and we have a tentative agreement in place with RCTV to continue doing that. Approving this article will not affect the general fund operating budget at all. Income report. Mr. Brandt. At our meeting on March 13th, the Finance Committee voted 7-0 to recommend this article to town meeting. Is there further discussion? Yes, Mr. Bassino. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Phil Bassino, Precinct 5. My question is, under the present RCTV, they're actually subject to an annual audit. How will that affect this particular, how will these, this revolving fund affect that audit? I'm trying to understand what he asked. <laughs> I'll try. Mr. Elijah. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, RCTV and the town has successfully completed negotiations to extend their term. Um, I think their board met a week or two ago to do that. So there'll be a new contract as soon as it's signed. It'll be placed online, and an annual audit is still part of that. The tricky part of this whole thing, I, I guess, first of all, the DOR asked for the, something that happened two or three years ago and kept putting off the deadline. The legislature in their last session last fall was going to pass a, pass a legislation to deal with it, and they didn't. So the DRR, DOR told communities in, in mid to late February, you got to do something. Um, so it was quite a surprise to a number of communities such as Reading. Um, as, as best we understand from talking to the DOR, um, town meeting later during the budget process will ask to actually vote a budget line. Um, effectively, this just increases the transparency for the RCTV funding. It does not change anything legally. So again, town meeting will be asked to vote a certain amount. That's a not to exceed amount. 
if the revenues from Comcast and Verizon come in below that, they will get the amount that comes in and they cannot spend more than what comes in. So there will still be an annual audit. There will still be an annual uh, report to the select board. And some of the terms are modernized compared to when they were last struck. Um, but no question the whole process is going to be at least as transparent. And the fact we're discussing it in front of town meeting annually will certainly bring you into it. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, the motion carries. Business under Article 11, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to amend the general bylaw related to the inspections revolving fund. All that's really being changed here, as the bylaw is on the slide, is the name of Reading Village has been changed to the Metropolitan at Reading Station. So the name of the project has changed, so we're updating the bylaw to reflect that. And we have a FinCom report, Mr. Doerr. At our March 13th meeting, FinCom voted to recommend this to town meeting. Bylaw committee report, Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our April 9th meeting, the bylaw committee voted 5-0 to recommend the content of this article to town meeting. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are you ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 12, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This article is to authorize the spending on the revolving funds that fall under 53 E and a half of Chapter 44. All of the revolving funds are listed on the slide along with their proposed spending limits. One is highlighted, the inspections one um, is actually going up from 200,000 in the current year to 250 in fiscal 20. Oh, did I change it? Well set. Uh, FinCom report, Mr. Burkhart. At its meeting on March 13th, the Finance Committee voted to approve this article 7-0 to town meeting. Is there further discussion? Oh, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Maria. Um, do we ever get any money back if people over uh, spend? I mean, oh, we don't overspend the spending limit. Is that no, what you're they, Yeah. If, if, let's say they give uh, $200,000, they only cost 100000 Do we give the other 200000 back or do we keep it? We never take it out. We only take it out if we use it. Yeah, I'm talking what the people pay in. Oh, uh, do they, we give the money back? Of, yeah, no, do we no. give the money back? No, that's for us to monitor the projects. Yeah, but if there's money left over, that's what I'm saying. Do we ever give the money left over that's, that's that would monitor? Much. No, no, we don't um, give it back. Why, why not? We, we, you know, we're supposed to be business friendly, but uh, we say, well, the heck with you, we're going to keep your money. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Simmons? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. Why did the uh, expenditure limit go up on the uh, Metropolitan? It's not on that project specifically. It's on several projects that are ongoing. So there, that, that revolving fund is used as a source to pay for the economic development director, which we're hiring, plus to oversee several projects that are currently ongoing. Why did it go up? Why would they go up? <laughs> Mr. Lolasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, in, in my budget and the article, I had proposed 200000 same as last year. The Finance Committee suggested moving it up to 250000 because there's so much going on that okay. we couldn't anticipate what spending needs might arrive. Thank you. 
Further discussion? Yes, on the edge here. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dimitri Tsekras, uh, Precinct 4. I'm trying to understand what Mr. Brown was talking about. So I'm going to ask, I think, two questions. Um, am I to understand that a business developer puts money into this fund? And if, is it common that a business developer doesn't use that money, that the town doesn't need to use that money? Is it common that there's money left over? Mr. Lolasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, just, just to be clear, the funds that go in are not sort of extra funds just because they're on a list. They're the building and other permit fees that normally would go into the general fund. And this is a mechanism set up many years ago by town meeting to help defray the costs of that project until it's finished. So years ago, um, when we developed a landfill, there were a lot of unexpected or unbudgeted costs that were hard to pay for um, because all the revenue went to the general fund and it thus was available during the year. So this is just a funding mechanism to help absorb costs as they happen. Um, it's not meant to tie out one-to-one -one in any sense. It's just whatever the permit fees were for the projects on the list go into the fund. Okay, so it's... It, it's apples and oranges to ask if there's money left over. That's f fees and permits, and that that's part of it. Correct. Towns don't generally give money back. Good. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, right in the middle. Sorry. Okay, you put a mic. Ah. Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, I'd asked this before. Um, is our fee structure, a lot of these services should be covered under the fees. Um, you know, there's a bunch of projects here, some major in scale. Is our fee structure set enough, set up where we're recouping enough of these costs? If a developer wants to come into the town, we need to, you know, do our due diligence with the inspections and stuff, but that's what the building permit fees, a lot of it, is supposed to cover. So is our fee structure adequate? Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the math there is actually fairly complex, but the simple answer is yes. Um, our fees tend to be a tiny bit low, um, but if you go to another community, what typically happens from what I've seen is the fees per whatever are higher, but the building inspector will say, well, that's only a $100,000 job when the contractor knows full well it's a $200,000 job. Oh, yeah. So the real key is what money are you collecting? And I think our fees are um, reasonably in line, and more importantly, the accurate by our building inspectors is much closer to the real costs, which is, again, not the way everyone does business. Um, are, we, are we asking for um, actual project costs at the end of the project? Um, um, Typically, a lot of towns do that. Yes, yes, but not an necessarily in all the smaller, you know, home projects, for yeah, instance. Yeah, right. But yes. These larger developments, it right. could be, to your point, someone comes in, you know, with a $1 million project and it skyrockets to a, you know, $1.7 million project. Uh, it's case by case, to be honest with you. The bulk of the fees are agreed to up front, and then it really depends as to whether there's additional fees. All right. Thank you. Further discussion? Then appearing, are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 13, Ms. Delios. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Article 13 is the annual allocation plan under the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. This was a fund that was established under Chapter 140 of the Acts of 2001. And this fund is a resource that can be used to produce new or preserve existing affordable housing. And just to um, digress slightly, if I may, um, the background contained in your warrant report talks about the town of Reading being on the brink of 10%. And I'm very pleased to tell you tonight that we have surpassed that benchmark and that important requirement. Thank you. I really want to acknowledge all of you in this room that were a big part of that. 
In Reading, we take our planning seriously and we proactively set about trying to meet this goal. And with your help, we crafted a housing production plan, which the select board adopted and endorsed. We also came to town meeting on numerous occasions and had some very colorful conversations about zoning and how we use zoning to get there. And I know that many of you will recall how exciting those conversations became. They were exciting for me. <laughs> but without everybody, to the spirit of the comments that were made earlier, without everybody working together, we could not have reached this goal. And in addition to being at 10.48%, we also received a one-year safe harbor. So that if something were to happen over the next year, and it's way too complicated and too boring for me to explain the nuances, uh, but if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'd be happy to go into great detail. But there, there are some moving targets around how the state keeps this inventory of affordable housing. So as an extra insurance policy, we went for and was, uh, we were awarded a one-year safe harbor. So that means we have a year off from 40 Bs. And boy, no one in this room is happier than I am. <laughs> but to go on with the article before you, um, the current balance is just over 300,000. And these funds really were only used in uh, one time that I'm aware of, which was the Atlantic Redevelopment Project, uh, the Oak Tree Development on 30 Haven Street. And so this really is a resource, and it does require town meeting to act and adopt an annual allocation plan. And uh, as, as it states in your uh, warrant report, administration, the max can only be up to 5%, but no more than 10,000. Um, and it can be used for a variety of different programs from new affordable housing, preserving affordable housing, or converting units. Thank you. Income report. Uh, OK. Finance Committee met March 13th, 2019, to support this Article 7-0. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All of, oh, I'm sorry. On the, uh, yes. Where did Jean go? Jean, a question. Oh, sorry. Demetra Sekris, uh, Precinct 4. What I don't understand, and congratulations, I know everyone it should be very happy about this. What happens when more housing gets built and then we go back to less than 10%? Is the plan that we're always going to maintain what we are at now with future development? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think okay. I know where you're going. Let me see, take a crack at it. <laughs> so the shifting sands of how the state uh, quantifies where we're at is a little complicated, but I'll try and make it simple. The, the state creates an inventory, and if you're ever having trouble sleeping at night, go onto the state website and you can look at all the different inventories of affordable housing. They're, they're all up there. Um, and that inventory is kept for only the units that are deed-restricted affordable housing units. So the way we simplify it is we say, it's only the top number that the state is tracking. Only the numerator, not the denominator. Mm -hmm. So it's a great night. We're here to celebrate being at 10.48%. But of course, in affordable housing, our work is never done. Okay. And when the decennial census is updated whatever, whenever that happens, um, there will be a recalculation. And there will be a, a larger universe of, of units. And we very likely will slip back. Okay. But we do have a housing production plan that calls for numerous strategies so that we can move this forward and continue to add to our affordable housing inventory. And those are the strategies that we would continue to work on uh, as much as I'd like to say we're, we're there and we're done and, you know, we don't have to do any more. We always have to do more. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are you ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. 
Business under Article 14, Mr. Lalasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, on here on behalf of the town and the schools, I'm being approached by the schools, so I can tell that. Um, to ask that we both have permission, both the superintendent and the town manager have permission to enter a technology backup system contracts for greater than three years, but no longer than six years. Um, to my recollection, last year this body approved a digital curriculum for the schools longer than three years, and then a few years back approved a 10-year contract for rubbish, and each has worked out very well. Um, and anyone who's good at math can tell that if, that if procurement laws say there's a three-year limit, guess what the market pricing looks like? It's very cheap in years four and five because most people won't go to their legislative body and ask for permission. So this is one um, that the schools found out first and then the town quickly agreed that um, it would be much cheaper for us to be able to enter into a contract longer than three years. Um, there is no current capital plan for this work. We're just setting the groundwork by asking the permission in advance. Um, what is likely to happen as we roll forward is either this will be spent out of our $100,000 uh, allocation that each side school and town gets every year, um, that a separate capital item be presented to you at a future town meeting, or it is possible that as the building security issue gets discussed with you and, and rolled out a little further, that we'll want to have this in place before the bu uh, school building security issue is finished. So proactively, we're asking you for permission to get into uh, contracts longer than three years, but no, no longer than six years. Income report, Ms. Perry. Finance Committee met March 13th and voted 7-0 to support this article. Anytime we can financially benefit from having an article like this and having a longer time period, we'd support that. Further discussion? Mr. Sasso? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Just a quick question. So is the intent here, though, for this to be a combined um, agreement for both town and school backup facilities or just one or the other? I, I, we don't know. It could be. Um, our technology, we have two different technology staffs, but they work together pretty well. Um, this is an area where we do tend to go back and forth and rely on each other as a backup, so I would tend to think it would be shared, but I can't say for sure. And just to follow up, I'm assuming at this point, though, there currently are backup procedures and agreements in place. Yeah, and, and what it what really happens is um, we're both looking forward and seeing in not in you know not too many more years we're running out of space for storage. Okay. Right. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, right right here. Yes. Uh, Nick Boyvin, Precinct Seven. Uh, just a question about the language uh, in that we have in our packet. Uh, for Article 14. So it, it follows on the question that was just asked, um, but with respect to language. So when I read this, it's saying we're authorizing superintendent and town manager. To me, the and is not in order. So that would require both the town manager and the superintendent to enter into any contract under this article. So is, is that the understanding of those who, who drafted this? And then, and then kind of follow on to that is, if you read down later and you get to the two provided clauses, um, there are two clauses that apply only to the superintendent but not to the town manager. So I, I'm wondering if someone could explain you know, how, how this article is intended to work. As, as I read it, the town manager and the superintendent need to both enter the contract, um, but the superintendent needs to provide additional documentation to the school committee, and then there's also some additional approval of the town manager, and, and that last approval seems redundant if it requires both parties to enter into the contract. Thank you. Mr. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, if you look at the beginning of the article, um, when it mentions the superintendent slash designee, town manager slash designee, it then says into a contract or contracts. So one of us would do one contract, two of us might do two contracts, or we might do one. So it's flexible. It doesn't mandate that we must both do it. The expectation would be what's good for one is good for the other. Um, the reason for the language more towards the end of the article is the school committee is the fiduciary body responsible for the school spending. Um, I am for the town spending, and then as the chief procurement officer for anything larger than 25000 that buck always stops with me, uh, even a school item. Further discussion? Yes. H 
Hi, uh, Tony Capobianco, Precinct 3. Uh, could you elaborate on what you mean by technology backup systems? Mr. Lasher. That could be a very da dangerous answer. Um, I'm not going to know the nuts and bolts, but I can tell you that um, every day and more often during the day, we back up a lot of our files, um, both schools and town. Some of it's um, very secure and, and private information. Some of it's public information. Um, video, and that gets into public security, is another growing component, if you will, of digital storage. So it's a wide variety of things you use at your desktop, things that one department might use. It could be video, it could be audio, and it could be um, a document. It's of all types. We also have a number of financial software systems. Um, I think the town tends to have more than the schools. Um, and they run regular badly every night, sometimes more often. So it's this off-site backup storage system of all the work we do that is un in question right here. And we're running into, or at least in three years, we'll be running into space issues for storage. We need to grow it. So is that physical tape located within Reading? I'm not going to answer. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Entering into a six-year contract, does that reduce your ability to uh, react quickly to changes in the technology sector and then back up opportunities? Um, it could possibly, which is why we'll be careful about the length. Um, usually if we enter a contract in technology, we have some kind of a, an escape or cancellation clause uh, where we're the ones in charge of that, not the vendor. The vendors typically are okay with that. There would be some sort of financial component to escaping that? Not necessarily, if it's agreed to up front. Okay. Further discussion? Appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 15, Dr. Doherty. Thank you very much. This is uh, another one of the capital projects that um, you're going to hear about during town meeting sessions. This one is a debt authorization for uh, Turf 2. I'm going to, as you can see here, this is a picture of where the Turf 2 lies um, in the, uh, the blackened area. So I'm going to talk a little bit about. So, in November of 2018, town meeting approved um, 227,000, oh, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong slide, sorry. That was elementary enrollment, going on to the next one. So in November 2018, town meeting approved the finance committee's request to fund $200,000 to fund design services for Turf 2. Uh, We've had uh, several meetings at, with, at school committee where we've talked about um, the impact that Turf 2 uh, has right now. We've, we've had to spend, a, uh, the facilities department uh, core, town core has had to spend a significant amount of funds to keep t Turf 2 um, repaired. So it is in much needed repair for re uh, upgrade for a replacement. Um, and what, where we are right now is we've gone through a situation where we've been um, providing updates to the, to the school committee. There's been a working group um, that has consisted of DPW, town, school, school, school and town facilities that have been meeting with the design firm Activis, which has narrowed the focus of the project to the following scope. Um, and this was based on things that we also had with the school committee on this. So turf two replacement in kind with new lights. So keeping the current footprint um, of turf two, replacing it and installing new lights. It should be noted that the, the current lights that are in turf two um, are, are not at the level that we can use them for any type of game conditions uh, at night because, especially in, in lacrosse type games. 
In addition, the working team has developed a, a list of ad alternates um, that are going to be prioritized and brought forth to a larger decision-making group in the near future that's going to include the superintendent, myself, town manager, athletics, and, and recreation. And that's, that's coming up a little bit. The, the thoughts to expand the length of turf to were deemed unnecessary through consultation with athletics, recreation, and a review with outside council. One of the things that we made sure that we, we looked at in involving council is to, that we had equal types of facilities um, for both uh, gender sports and uh, across the board and turf too and would be one of those things considered and it's taking a look at all of the different sports that are offered um, at at the high school as part of title nine uh, based upon these discussions school committee directed us not to proceed with obtaining pricing to expand turf two so that so what we're looking at this evening and the request that we're making is is to replace turf two in the current footprint with, with the lights. Following the kickoff meeting, following the kickoff meeting, subsequent meetings have been held with DPW, engineering, facilities, school department, and activities to review the scope, the budget, and the preliminary design drawings. So this has been a very collaborative effort um, with school and town departments um, in making sure that, that we put forward the best proposal that we can. And then based upon these initial meetings, the working group is confident that the funding figure as presented to and approved by Finance Committee as part of the budget meetings is adequate to complete the project, which um, is being proposed this evening. And then once the project is bid out and awarded pending town meeting funding approval, we anticipate that it's going to begin construction in late summer into early fall. We have, and you'll, you'll see when we review the school department budget with town meeting, that an amount of funding has been put aside um, in the athletic budget as, as part of addressing any changes that we need to make in scheduling or perhaps putting portable lights um, at another uh, field in town so that uh, in the absence of using turf two this fall. So we are going under the anticipation that there will not be any athletic events on turf two this fall um, because of the construction timeline that, that's, that's being presented currently. Do you need to talk to me? No. Incom report. Ms. Herrick? Okay, regarding Article 15, FinCom voted 7.0 to approve this and recommend it to town meeting. Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Sekwa? Mr. Sekwa? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dimitri Sekras, Precinct 4. A question. Can this be done in the summer so that it's ready for the fall, or is it just prohibitively too late at this point? So a couple of things. One is that the timeline may prohibit us to do that. The other thing is we're trying to time this in a way where we can also get the best possible uh, cost to go out to bid. And so the, time, the timing is, is, would, would be more favorable towards the late summer, early fall. And I'm sure that you've done the math on having to rent portable light and schlepping kids over to other fields and all of that. That doesn't tip the, the math? That seems no, expensive, it would too. No, it, it would be significant okay. difference. Yeah. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, right here. Hi, my name is Bob Coulter from Precinct 6. Um, I um, just want some clarity about the lighting situation that you have. The, well, m meaning, I thought the whole intent was to be able to play ball at night with the new lights. It sounds like you're not going to be down there having No, no, the current lights. The current lights are not 
uh, for game conditions. Okay. The lights that are going to replace it will be. Oh, they will be? Yes, so they be, will be. be. I'm sorry I miss, okay. if I misspoke. No, the current lighting is not optimal for game conditions. Okay, so they, they can't play night. And I thought there was going to be an expansion of potentially um, a wall ball facility down there with, with uh, I know there was some talk about uh, some other organizations paying for that for lacrosse. So if there was to be a wall ball donated by an organization, there would have to be one of equal uh, donated where the other lacrosse field is, which is at Parker Middle School, because then you would have a Title IX issue. But it, so it's not included in this project at all? No, it's, it is not. And, and why was it deemed, I guess, uh, uh, there was no expansion of the field to make it more of a multi-use? Was it too expensive to extend the length for more well, soccer it, or football? Well, it would be a greater expense, and that would be more, I think, a, the DPW could explain, because it would be going into um, areas that involve drainage, water, um, things like that. You have some conservation issues as well. Um, so that, that was part of the reason. It would be a much more expensive project. Well, it's a, well, a, a one-time shot. Um, you know, Reading's a great athletic town. It seems like restricting that field size, because it is a very small field right now. And we could get more of a multi-use. I mean, we should be talking about adding another one behind Coolidge right now, rather than just this one. But was there any thought about building behind Coolidge prior to this, so these things could maybe be done in parallel? Well, no, the, the focus was always replacing Turf 2 because of the condition of Turf 2 right now. It, it was becoming a safety issue. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Binda. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, when I first heard about this in the fall, it sounded like the condition of it was um, dangerous for students to play on. So I completely support um, doing the field over. I also completely support doing the lights at the same time. It makes sense to do it all. So I'm completely in favor of Article 15. Um, what I'm asking for, however, is a reduction in the amount from $2.25 million to $1.75 million. And the reason for this is that the town has previously authorized debt for turf to lighting. And I believe that that money should be used before additional debt is asked for turf to lighting. So this is simple and it's also complicated. Um, I'll try to keep it simple. I also want to state that I'm not discussing Birch Meadow Lighting Field Project, the merits of it, when it should be done. I'm only speaking about the funding for it. So for members, people who weren't here in 2015, the um, 2015 special town meeting, Article 4 authorized $1 million for five fields. The five fields were the lighted softball field, the softball field, turf two, Morton field, and the little league field. So there is, there is, there was one million dollars authorized. A hundred thousand dollars has been spent. There is nine hundred thousand dollars worth of debt authorization for lighting for the Birch Meadow area, which includes turf two. Um, that's the simple answer. That's the simple thing that we've already authorized debt. I would like to see that debt spent um, before, before more money for turf two has been added. So what's happened in between? $100,000 has been spent, $900,000 of debt authorization still exists, and if you go to your town meeting warrant on page 178, you'll see where that is. Now in 2016, the town put out um, an RFP and received bids, and these were received, I think, in 2016. What I have is that three bids were under $1.5 million. Two of them were over. And three of them were under $1.5 million. And then in the fall of 2017, the capital improvement plan was changed to, to move up to $1.5 million. So you'll see that on page 178. There has been discussion at 
the recreation committee level and the select board level, I read back and went through meeting minutes from 2016 about um, if we couldn't do all of the fields, what fields were to be done, what priority was it, would they be done in, what, and, and there was discussion about ordering the fees. Um, and the bids that I've, that I've seen also break it down by field, but um, it's my understanding that according to um, Massachusetts procurement law, things need to be broken down like that. I think I, I read that in, um, in one of the meetings. So for me, the bottom line is I'm in favor of this. I do not want to authorize additional debt for turf two. I want to use some of the Birch Meadow lighting money for this part of the project. Now, I was told that the lighting portion of this was $500,000. If you take $1.5 million and divide it by five fields, that's $300,000 a field. Um, and why do I think this is important? I think this is important, I, I, I want to spend the money, but I really think it's important from a transparency um, and, and an accounting. We're looking at a lot of really big capital improvement projects coming on board, and I think it's really important to see where the money's being spent, how much, if you break projects up into little pieces, if they were all together, how much would that be? I mean, when town meeting authorized a million dollars, it was for five fields. So if you remove one of the fields, you've reduced the project by 20%, but now you've asked for $1.5 million and you'll be paying for that separately. So I really, I think it's important for, um, for transparency's sake, for accounting's sake, that the lighting portion, and I'll, I want to make a motion to reduce it by three to five hundred thousand dollars. I'm up for, you know, if somebody agrees with me, if they want to say three hundred rather than five hundred thousand. Well, before we go on, what is your actual? Proposal? So my motion is to reduce the amount of the debt authorization in Article 15 from 2.25 million dollars to 1.75 million dollars and to use previously authorized debt for the remaining remainder of it. Is there a second to that? Second, okay. Sorry. And, um, yeah, so, that, so, so I, I'm in favor of it. I just want it to come from the previously authorized debt. Okay, further discussion. We will now talk about the amendment. Mr. Lalasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, <clears throat> A lot of what you say is correct. Um, Bond Council is one of the most transparent bodies I, I run into in my job. Um, if town meeting attempts to change the wording of this on the floor, I'm not certain we'll be allowed to sell debt. If you would come to us in the fall before the Warren article was set, we could have correct language. Let me just make sure everyone understands. There was a million dollars of authorization granted. The town borrowed $100,000 and spent $100,000 to do some site work and to get bids on the five fields. Um, those bids were clearly in excess of the million dollars. So at the time, uh, Chair Halsey and I agreed to just cancel a project rather than do part of the project. The remaining 900000 authorized is authorized. There's no money. There's no cash. There's no spending. It's permission for us to borrow 900000 um, to accomplish what, what Ms. Binder has just asked, perhaps we could have had a second article that rescinds a portion of that $900,000 that remains to keep us honest and make sure we don't reborrow for the fifth field again. Um, in point of fact, when those four fields come up, should they come up, and the Recreation Committee seems to have it on schedule for either November or April town meeting in the future, um, that number could well change. Uh, the million four is a placeholder. It was as of, I believe it was last summer, estimates for the four remaining fields. But again, that's not on this floor. That's not for debate. Um, what you want to try to do is move permission or share permission and, and this article, I don't think Bond Council will allow that to happen retroactively. It could have happened in advance, but I'd be very cautious about doing it now. 
Um, I, I suppose it comes down to somewhat of an issue of trust. Uh, that this body has authorized and none, none of the 900,000 that we have not borrowed. And, you know, one would like to think that we will not borrow it until there's a funding plan. There's no money in the capital plan to pay for it. Um, so whenever this other article comes before you, if it does, for other field lighting, that's when we'll have this discussion. There's 900,000 authorized. We would like a total of whatever the number is. Can you please authorize this much more? Or probably what's more likely to happen is we'll say there's $900,000 authorized. Can you please just get rid of that? Because the language is not accurate to what the new project will be. And here's the new project and the new amount. Um, you know, again, had it been um, a topic uh, kind of brought up during the budget process, perhaps we could have had an article to rescind all 900,000. Makes no difference to me. It's, it's not something we can borrow and we can use. So I'd be very cautious um, from a bond council standpoint. This article has been put together as a solid project. Um, the funding is going to go out uh, to the debt markets and the prospectuses are very, very uh, looked at very carefully not by me when I used to be an investor, but people do that. Um, and I would really hate with all the scheduling the schools have done is to come back with some kind of a technical flaw in the language and say, I'm sorry, we have to wait till November town meeting to re-vote this if it's split. Okay, continuing debate on the proposed amendment. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Middle. Mr. Boyven, Mr. Boyven. Oh, we switching people here? I had called on you actually. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Heather Klisch, Precinct 7. I support the work that needs to be done at Turf. I have a question about, about this. Um, is there a time limit on the authorizations, like the previous authorization that town meeting voted? Does it sunset at any time, or is it just indefinite? I think it's, in, I think it's indefinite. Sharon, do you know? Mm -hmm. I think until you, town meeting rescinds the authorization, it's always on the books. Huh, okay. Usually what we do is we gather a few of them because sometimes there's authorized debt that is a small bit more than we needed. And we usually bunch them together and ask every four or five years for town meeting to, you know, get rid of all these authorized projects. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Nick Boyan, Precinct 7. Um, so the question, if I can address it to the town manager, um, that. I mean, for everybody, but look, just for the town manager, you're, there, there are two separate things here that I don't want to confuse. One is the appropriation amount, and the second is the borrowing amount, right? What, what this motion does is it sets the appropriation amount at 2.25 million, and then separately it authorizes borrowing, and it's that second thing that causes the need for a two-thirds vote here, right? And that's under the, uh, this MGL chapter 44, section 7.1. Um, so I guess my first question for the for the town manager is when you when you said that changing this article could um, complicate going to the bond markets to secure financing for this, is that a reference to only part one to just changing the 2.25 million dollar appropriation, or is that also a reference to changing the the author's amount? Mr. Lalasher. Um, well, town meeting will need to appropriate the total amount regardless. The question is, what do you authorize tonight? And do you use some old authorization and some new authorization and mix them together? And that's the part I'm saying is very dangerous, that I don't have permission from bond council to do that. It could work. Um, I don't know that it will work. And I really don't want to find out that it wouldn't work after the fact. That's all. So if, just a follow-on question yes. to that. So if, if, if this town, if, if town meeting um, keeps the $2.25 million appropriation and tries to alter the language, or in any way alters the language later on where it says, is authorized to borrow said sum, referring to the $2.25 million, that, for instance, if, if, if we amended that language after said sum, um, we said minus previously authorized applicable debt, that could create the complexity you're talking about where then you would have to that's, track down where you piece together that that's authorization. Correct. Okay, so in that case, I'm, I'm not in favor of changing the language of this article. Thanks. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Ms. Binda. Thank you, Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, with all due respect, we, we have had conversations about this back in February, and I have attended the past two... But, but not before the warrant was closed. Not before... Not, not before the board closed the warrant for the, for the town meeting. When did the warrant close? Late January or February. I don't remember the exact date. 
I, I didn't hear about this um, recent thought you had until Sharon told me a couple days ago. It, it, it was, it was, it wasn't something. Uh, we have we we have discussed this, and I know before the warrant closed. But I have gone to FinCom meetings. I've spoken to people, and I did call Miss Angstrom last week. So it's I didn't come here to spring this on. I have been. Well, if I may, I'm well aware of your interest in the issue, but I never heard you propose that you wanted to use an old debt authorization as part of tonight until last week. Okay. I, I'm still wondering if it's possible to make a motion to do that. Yeah. Ms. Herrick? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Karen Herrick, Precinct 8. Um, I'd like to thank town meeting member um, Angela Mbinda for, for going back to 2016 and before and, and, and looking at these things. And as she stated, it's not so much a trust, and it's not that she doesn't support this, but our budget has gotten larger and larger and larger and more complicated. And, and I trust Bob when he says that we want to be careful before we um, waste all the effort he's put into going forward for a bond for this project. Um, and again, I, I thank Angelo. As a town meeting member, sometimes it's a little difficult to do a deep dive on these topics, and sometimes we're not even able to do that in FinCom. So without members and the effort, putting in efforts like this, things can get lost. And, um, and she's told me that she's been able to reach out to Sharon and, and Bob gotten responses, and, and that, that's awesome. That's the way we all need to work together. So if this body decides that Perhaps we don't want to change the authorization for the Turf 2 field as written in the town warrant. I would certainly be supportive of um, an alternative uh, going back and reevaluating the pre authorized debt for the fall, maybe via an instructional motion that it doesn't get lost because. She's, she raises a very valid point, and it's hard for all of us um, to keep track of this. So, thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. Um, I think I also agree Angela made a really good point about the transparency on this. Um, but also, I understand the need to kind of move this um, down the field, no pun intended. Um, Bob, is it possible to get an opinion of bond council within the next few days? Potentially, let's postpone this until either Thursday or the following Monday. So if you get a read on it and they say it's okay, then, then Angela can come and remake her proposal and then we can rescind the $900,000 of debt that we don't need that we can then just authorize again at another time. I mean, it does make it cleaner. Um, but again, if, if, if this is a simple, I don't know, is this a simple phone call, is this a memo? Um, it would be great to get that information. We have another potential week of town meeting. Potentially we can kind of put this on the table or postpone it for a little bit until you get some clarity, and then we can then vote on the amendment. Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the, there's some things I know for sure, and there's some things I don't know. One thing I know for sure is you cannot rescind any debt at this town meeting. There is not an article to do so. Um, if you're not happy about the 900000 that exists you, and you want to rescind it, we'll do that at a future town meeting. Um, I have very low confidence that I can get a legal opinion to turn it around that fast that will be bulletproof. I can tell you that this one's been worth, worked on for a couple months and it is bulletproof to go to the debt markets with. Um, I, I can't answer the question. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what Bond Council will say. Um, I think Bond Council will be quite surprised at the complexity of the suggestion, with all due respect, compa compared to this is a real simple, clean two and a quarter million dollar request. If there hadn't been debt authorized, we'd be finished. Okay, so there is debt authorized. If you don't want it to be authorized, rescind it. Rescind the permission to do it. That's the cleanest legal way. To do something else that's complicated is, is getting into gray waters, and I just can't answer for bond counsel. Um, if you want to give me another couple days, there's no guarantee whatsoever that I'll have an answer for you, honestly. 
What, what, I, what I don't want to happen is for us to think everything's okay and us to go to the debt markets and for the debt markets for some lawyer at a, at a buyer's firm to say, oh no, that doesn't work. You can't borrow till you have another town meeting next November. That's my fear of the risk. And I can't tell you quantified how big the risk is. I can just tell you that it's there. Ms. Doctor. Nancy, Dr. Precinct, um, may I ask, since Town Council has heard this discussion, could um, Town Council actually give us an opinion? <laughs> you, you have heard the discussion. I would be interested. Mr. Meharis. You are no friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Ray Meares, your town council. Um, so in matters of bond issuance, uh, uh, every community I represent uh, goes to the same bond council. Uh, that's Lock Lord. Uh, it's a great big law firm in Boston. And particularly uh, either to Rick Manley, who handles uh, Reading, or uh, to one of the other partners there. Um, the reason we do that is because at the end of the day we want to make sure that whatever bonds are authorized here are actually marketable. And Rick will have to certify that the bonds as issued were properly authorized, that the terms that town meeting voted on were uh, uh, were appropriately entered into and that the funds in fact are going to be used within the terms of the authorization. Um, uh, so Bob's idea that this is clean, we know what this, uh, what this is for, uh, this gives us a straight line from point A to point B. We're going to now go back and repurpose another uh, a, another borrowing at another time, um, I'm sure the bond council is going to be concerned about whether the use that is being put to those funds was in fact the same as what was contemplated five years ago, whatever, how long ago it was. Um, and um, uh, um, he's going to want to think about it. Uh, I would want to think about it. I'd want to have to go back and look the, at the minutes of the old town meeting um, before I'd be able to, to help him to make a decision. But at the end of the day, it all matters almost nothing what I think. It only matters what Rick Manley thinks. And, um, and he's a, 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 a pretty conservative guy. So, um, um, the, so long and the short of it is, I'm not sure I can answer the question. Uh, and I'm certainly not prepared to, uh, to try to do so without studying uh, previous votes. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark Doxer, Precinct 1, member of the Select Board. Um, I wonder if there may be a way that we can work this as two pieces. I think it's very important that we get Article 15 passed just because of the condition of the field. Um, and I know that there's really no objection to doing that. Sorry, let's go really, is this better? Okay, sorry, I think this is the answer, you'll hold it like this. Um, I'm wondering if what we could do is consider Article 15 now as written so that we don't run into the issues that are being discussed and then have for the November town meeting um, bring up a warrant article to revoke the past authorized debt and just make it very simple that way. So we don't confuse the two topics. Um, I don't know if an instructional motion helps to, to make that an insertion at the end of town meeting, but to bring it up to the board to come as a, uh, a revocation article for the next town meeting. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? None appearing. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Baraski. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jean Browski, Precinct 6. 
Um, I agree with many of the commentators, many of the, my fellow town meeting members who feel that it's important that we pass this given the risk um, of not getting the, the field fixed. So I, I'm, I'm not going to support the amendment as it stands, and I will support Article 15. Um, in terms of how we solve the other problem, which is this existing capital plan and how we adjust it, I like the idea of an instructional motion, but I, I, I'm hesitant to say exactly what the solution is. I like the idea of an instructional motion that instructs the finance committee, the town manager to put their heads together, come back to this body with what we do with that capital um, line item. So I would support an instructional motion that was broad and instructs them to come back to us with the solution. I wouldn't want to say we should revoke it completely because we that might have unintended consequences that I don't know that we can solve here tonight. So I would support an instructional motion that was broad. Ms. Binda? Um, I think it's important to get this work done now, so I will withdraw my amendment, if, if I made one, so that we can go forward with this now and then take it up again in the fall. Is there any objection to withdrawing the amendment, proposed, proposed amendment? None appear and the amendment has been withdrawn. Okay, we were back to discussing the main motion under Article 15. Mr. Brown? The question came up why the field was not looked at to extend it. Uh, you, I was around when they built it. There was a 20-inch water main that was rerouted because of it, uh, very costly. Shortly thereafter, we changed to MWA, and I don't think we use that water line anymore. Uh, and it's right there. There's also a building that houses all the sprinklers for the whole system, so it would be very, very expensive to extend that field, and I'm sure that DPW will agree with me. Further discussion? Yes, right in the middle. Mark Ventura, Precinct 1. Um, we're going to have this same discussion with Turf 1 that's in not as in dire need of replacement, but is well beyond its useful life, I would say, especially considering the amount of use it gets. Um, was there any economy in scale with these contracts? I know, I'm sure you looked at Turf 1 as well, because that discussion's come up. I was at a school committee meeting maybe five or six months ago, and um, I heard the terms, the fields are unsafe, um, which you acknowledge tonight on turf two. Is there any economy and scale for trying to contract both of these? Obviously, you can't do them at the same time because of use, but um, we'll be here next year talking about turf one. So, I mean, two birds with one stone type thing. I know it's desperate need at turf two. Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, one of the things the town does look at is economies of scale when doing work. So, you know, many moons ago we were looking at lighting all five fields because it is cheaper to have a lighting contractor come out once and do five things instead of twice to do one and four, for instance. Um, there's two issues with redoing two turf fields. One is where people play. You mean you're, you're basically canceling sports for a while. And as it's currently scheduled, um, let me let me back up a little. At November town meeting and subsequent discussions with FinCom, we had considered asking for a special town meeting in the winter to do turf too faster. Um, what we learned was, um, as John has mentioned, the pricing would have not been advantageous to do it that way, and we really wouldn't have removed the risk entirely that the fall season could be played on turf two. So as it is now, we're going to lose the summer and we're planning to lose the fall, and that wouldn't have mattered whether we did the work two months ago or three months ago or today. Um, there's just no practical way to take two turf fields offline, and we don't have the money. Well, um, right. You can't do it simultaneously. No. So I, I would say no to the economies of scale of doing two, two turf fields. If you're talking about the same location and the same product, yes, I would think it would be marginal savings to do a second turf field. And there's more work needed at the stadium field, not just turf. There's also track work and other things. No, I know. It's just it's getting to that point where, you know, kids are playing football on it. Um, right. And, you know, it's, it hurts. If you look at the other fields, if you walk on them, a little more padding under them, we, you know, we're pretty, I think I have half the black pebbles, you know, throughout my house uh, <laughs> from everything. But uh, I, I think um, 
turf one definitely needs to look at be looked at as well. Um, you know, to have a new turf field in town will be a tremendous asset that you can then hopefully take turf one offline in the future when funds are found. Um, but to do it at the same time, I just don't see it. Is Parker being looked at as, as to pick up some of the slack while this um, happens? Yeah. yeah. It, it is. The, some Dunn. of the funding uh, that is in the operating budget for this in FY20 is for either tra additional transportation for away games uh, in case we can't play home games and or additional uh, per, uh, portable lighting at Parker. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Friedman. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Ms. Binda for her um, proposed er, amend amendment that she um, ultimately uh, retracted. Um, I think it made a lot of sense, it seemed certainly clear enough to me. Um, I also respect uh, the town manager's concern and, and town council's concern that if this was changed uh, th that we might not get the money for turf 2 to repair turf 2 but uh, what and I don't know if there's any need to change this but I always saw a town meeting as a group of people who um, could discuss these proposals for spending money and perhaps change them if that's was the will of town meeting. Um, but um, the way this uh, proposal came out, and maybe this was the only way it could be done, is that really there's no opportunity for discussion on this, it seems, that we either accept it um, or run the risk of not getting the money for, for Turf 2, which I think we all agree needs, needs to happen. So something perhaps to look forward to in the future um, to allow town meeting to weigh in on these topics um, and uh, debate how much money they want to spend on these projects, et cetera. Thank you. Mr. Lasher. Um, just, just to be clear, town meeting has every right to debate the amount of this. It can go higher, it can go lower, the scope of the project can get larger or smaller. The only technical difficulty was in trying to combine an old and a new authorization. It's not to take any rights away from you to decide what project gets done. Further discussion? Yes, over in the middle here. Hi, Danica Medeiros, uh, Precinct 3. I just have a question regarding the potential for grants for this, as it says that you can apply for grants, the select board, um, school committee, etc. So do you have any idea of potential grants that are out there and how much those might be for? And if so, how will that affect the debt? Um, how will that be paid back towards the debt? Mr. Wilson. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, for those members, um, back when the library was um, asked, asked for as a debt authorization, the debt authorization is for the entire project dollar figure. The actual sources of funding can be different in the future. Um, both John and I have asked our legislators for additional funding for turf fields, and um, I'd have to say they're very remote at best. Um, we've also asked them to help out with building security, and they're a little bit lukewarm to that, and one would suppose that that money would be easier to come by than turf fields. Uh, but should anyone want to donate money for this project, the debt authorizations for two and a quarter million, um, we will actually borrow less. That's just the pro cost of the project, but again, if there's private money that ever comes in and it comes in in a timely fashion, we'll certainly borrow less. Okay, thank you very much. Further discussion? Yes, right here on the edge. Going Savatelli, Precinct 6. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned Title IX earlier. So when this new project is done, is there any chance where you'll figure out a, a, a rotation with the girls and boys lacrosse to switch, switch off every year or every other week or every other month? Because right now the girls are always at Parker. 
So, so that that's a great question. So the Title IX is looked at all sports together, not just lacrosse or soccer or whatever sports are played on that on the, that field. So in discussions I've I've had with uh, Tom Zaya, the athletic director, there will be more of a balance of games and practices of turf one and turf two for girls in boys lacrosse, because I believe that's the sports you're referring to. So yes, it, it's looked at as a balance, and it's not just the field use, because the fields, the fields actually, right now I would say the Parker Field is, right. is in better condition. It's also looking at the other pieces of the facility um, and making sure that the facilities are adequate and equal uh, for both. So right. we've, we've already had discussions about that in terms of making sure that we have a balance um, in using the available fields. Thank you. Another discussion? Mr. Simmons. Mr. Simmons? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. What's the lifetime of an artificial field properly maintained? That's good. That's good. Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> when, we bought, when we bought fields, we were told 20 years. Yeah. Years into it, they said, well, maybe more like 10 or 12. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so does it really matter what the salesman tells you? <laughs> How about um, a warranty? Uh, um, you can get one for three years or so, as I recall, uh, but not for year 10 or 12. It just, it just doesn't exist. We're paying $2 um, million dollars in three years. Uh, I, th I think as a planning mechanism, 15 years is reasonable. Um, what we have done in the last few years is fund maintenance of the turf fields more explicitly. Um, facilities department or the recreation department, it, d it depends on the field. Um, did work as was emergently needed. Now there's a routine funding mechanism in the FY20 budget, both in the schools and the towns, to take care of these fields. So I'm, I'm certainly convinced, and I'm not sure that they weren't taken care of in the past, but I know they will be in the future as best they possibly can. For $5,000 or $10,000 a year, it's certainly worth buying a couple of extra years of your field. And, how, and we, how, we use them heavily. Yes. It's not how, like the Patriots. <laughs> how how uh, old is a high school field? Um, just over 10, I think. Just over 10? Yeah. It, it's getting thin, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, yes. Uh, Nick Boyman, Precinct 7. Were there other um, alternatives to debt financing that were dis discussed in putting together this proposal, and, and what were they, and why is this the, you feel, the best path forward? Mr. Lasher. Um, there's any number of people that would like to lend us money and maybe call it a lease or other things. Um, the town's credit is very strong, and the amount of, or the method of financing we do is the cheapest, by far. Further discussion? Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote. I'm going to ask for some counters. Uh, Mr. Brown, would you like to take my right plus the Finance Committee? And let's see, Mr. Crook is not here. Uh, Ms. O'Neill, could I ask you to uh, count for me? Yes. Uh, and Ms. Hillary for the middle. And then over here on the left, uh, Mr. Pacino, would you take the thing? OK, uh, all those in favor, please rise. I don't think he's a town meeting. He wants it. Thirty five. Thirty five. 26. 26. 
44. 44. And those opposed? Please rise. <laughs> One. One. Zero. 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 The vote being 148 in the affirmative, one in the negative, the motion carries. Did we have a motion to adjourn? Did I, did I hear a motion to adjourn? Yes. There's a motion to adjourn until Thursday, April 25th. Is there a second? Se second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those in this session, this town meeting stands adjourned until Thursday evening.